Welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode with Stephen Cornett. Today is going to be a fun one all about chainsaws, cutting down trees, forestry management, silvopasture, trying to establish more grass amongst the trees so I can have a lot more area for my sheep to graze. So there will be chainsaw tips, but I'm not going to go into details about how to run a chainsaw, how to do cuts. Uh, I'm just going to be using a standard wedge cut and for 90% of the trees that you're going to drop, that's going to work great. I'm not chopping things next to my house or anything where it could be dangerous. So what I'm doing here and I've talked about the last couple of years is I'm trying to establish a silvopasture. So a silvopasture is trying to mimic nature to the ultimate form. To me it's one of the best regenerative agriculture techniques because you're combining trees, animals, grasses. If you want to combine some agroforestry and alley cropping and food forest, then you can apply all sorts of different regenerative farming techniques to this for whatever your context is. My context is wanting to create a lot more grass area, shade, protection. Um, I'm looking for trees that are going to produce nuts that will feed pigs in the future. So I hope you're starting to kind of see there's a lot here that we can discuss and talk about. But if you've never used a chainsaw before or you're just, you know, very beginner, don't start cutting big trees, don't start doing crazy stuff. You can learn a ton from this video, but you need to start on smaller trees and, and step up slowly to some of this bigger stuff. I'll put a video down in the description from a professional arborist um, that will teach you guys all about that stuff. So we're doing this process in the winter and that's when I recommend that you do all of this type of thing. All of your tree cutting is gonna be done in the fall and the winter. But this process starts in the summer actually because that's when you're gonna identify the trees that you really want to cut down because you'll be able to see the canopy, what's casting shade, the types of trees are obviously way easier to figure out when you can see the leaves. Uh, Google Lens and the app Picture This are two apps that I've used to help me really figure out what tree is which through pictures online, using the app, so that you can learn. And after two years, I know all the trees that are in my woods now. So in this first area, this is where I have my tropical stuff. So I've got a banana, I've got pomegranates, I've got figs, I've got elderberry. And in this area, I wanna open up more light for these trees. So a little bit different strategy than what we're gonna do over here in a couple minutes. So this tree that you're seeing here, this tree's already dead. It died in the summer. It lost all of its leaves, which told me it was dead. So I'm expecting this tree right here to have a hole on the inside of it, which is gonna make it much more dangerous to cut. And this is why when you're starting out learning, you need to just focus on healthy, straight trees and just cut those so that you can get good practice. And when we look at all the trees before we cut, we're gonna look, where is it leaning? and we wanna walk around it in a 360 to be sure it's leaning in the direction that we think it is. There's some times when you'll look from one direction and it looks like it's leaning a certain direction, but it's actually not when you look at it from another angle. Keep in mind the bend of the tree. Some trees are you know, pretty unhealthy in here and they're super bent over. Obviously that's gonna fall in that direction and there's not much change that we can make happen. The other thing I'm gonna look at is the placement of the branches up above. Are all, the, are all the branches growing on one side of, of the tree? That's gonna influence the angle because all the weight is leaning onto that side. So maybe the tree is leaning this way, but the a lot of heavy branches are leaning off to this direction. Now, when you cut your wedge, you may think it's gonna fall this way, but it's actually gonna fall more in the middle of those two points because of the weight of the branches. And these are all things that you will discover by doing this yourself and why you need to start with small trees first. Because I know this tree's gonna fall in this direction and I'm trying to avoid it hitting other things that I have in here, I'm also looking at other trees in the direction that it's going to fall. So I've got this little guy here that it may hit and I also don't really even want this tree here. There's nowhere for that tree to expand to. It's just in the way of these older, healthier trees. Then further over here, we have a bunch more smaller trees that I'm thinning out for that. Um, and then, so we'll cut all those down and then we'll come back and look at the canopy again and see if we want to trim it up anymore. So I'll show you one small tree. So this is an oak tree. As we go up, you can see the direction that it's leaning. What I can see is gonna happen when I drop this one, it'll basically hit the next tree that I wanna cut down. So I'm gonna cut that one first 
then come back to cut this one so nothing gets in the way and gets hung up on each other. It's super annoying when another tree lands on top of another tree because now you got to cut it underneath. It becomes more dangerous and more difficult. So looking at the future of where it's going to fall is really important. <laughs> So when you're cutting the wedge out of the tree, so what I do is I line it up to the direction that I think it's gonna, I want it to go. And then if you look on your chainsaw, there's an actual line that's perpendicular to the chainsaw blade. And that gives you a rough estimate of where it's gonna go according to the wedge that you've cut. And then I'm trying to cut in about a third and then I'm just gonna come up about an inch or two and cut the back. That was perfect right where we wanted it. And then, you know, we clipped the dogwood a little bit, but no damage, so perfect. So we got all the trees laid out right here in front of us. And now I'm chopping down these trees and I know some tree hugger out there is having a heart attack. But guess what? I can already see this tree's on its way to dying. There's a hole in it. And trees that are growing underneath a huge tree like this, they're not ever gonna get enough sunlight to ever become a full fledge tree. By doing this, I'm making the woods much more healthy. And I'm gonna use this wood. So you guys know I do my shiitake logs, which I highly recommend. If you guys wanna get into growing mushrooms, do logs. I've got a couple videos on that you can look at. Um, the rest of it will either be firewood or I can take it to my friend's house who has a mill and we can mill a bunch of this wood to use to build things with. And that's another reason why I labeled it all. I learned my lesson when I was trying to figure out what trees to cut for mushroom logs. Do that in the summer so you really know which, which is which. So I'm cutting down a lot of oak right now because I want to make a lot more shiitake logs. And oak is the best type of wood for shiitake and mini mushrooms. Okay, so this one right here is another great example of a tree that will never become something. And I just cut the wedge out and it is dead in the center. So this tree right here, you see how there's these other three trees with way better canopies. Um, they're gonna block the sun out. And as I just determined, it's already on its way to dying. And then here's another safety tip. Stand on the high side of where you're gonna cut this. This tree is set up to fall going this direction. So I don't wanna be cutting on the downside of this tree because I'm on the side that it's falling towards. It would be incredibly rare that that would fall all the way this way, but the tree is broken. So there's a higher chance of something going wrong. I'm gonna clear around that tree, giving me a space that I can run away from the tree. You wanna look on the ground. Is there something that you're gonna get your foot snagged on or something like that? Watch out because when the tree starts to fall, you need to get out of the way. Even if you know this tree is gonna, it's healthy and it's gonna fall in the right direction, just out of the correct habits of using a chainsaw, you gotta move. So make sure there's a path cleared around you to get out of the way. Okay, so looking at that tree, this is pretty dangerous actually. Let me show you how big the hole is inside. You guys can't see that, but it, it's going deep. Like, I can fit up to my elbow in there. My wedge angle could have been a little bit better, but ultimately it's because there's, this thing is so hollowed out inside, very tricky. It's wanting to now go this way. What I don't wanna have happen is to go backwards and hit my high tensile fence. That's an absolute disaster. I've been pounding in these wedges. Wedges are super valuable for directing the tree here. This should hopefully prevent it from going back. Here we go, a couple more hits and I think this is gonna fall, so get ready. Come on, baby. Oh my. Holy crap. That's a bit of a disaster right there. But it's not too bad because hey, at least it didn't fall on my fence. Check out how gnarly this was and why it was so difficult to control what it did. Basically the entire tree has been eaten up by termites. If you put a wedge into this and cut this, 
what happens? This falls down, possibly right on top of you. What I think is probably gonna be the safest for me, I'm gonna have to undercut this. <laughs> We got it guys that was sketchy but uh you can see how i worked it there just taking it little by little and once i heard it cracking i just tried to get out of there to let it fall on its own because i had all that weight on the back of that tree pushing down now one thing that gave me a little bit more safety was that tree that was stuck it had huge limbs up inside and twisted up i didn't see how it could fall um, towards me in any way obviously i took as much precaution as i could but Whew, got him all right. So now we're in my future silvopasture area. So we're gonna get into the nitty gritty now about which trees do we want to save or get rid of. So I'm gonna walk around with the camera and show you guys the different trees I've selected and why and some of the methodology behind all of this. Why don't we start right here with this beech tree. This is the tree in my area at least, it's the last to lose its leaves and it provides really great shade for animals, I noticed. So I'm a big fan of this tree. There are um, some mushrooms you can grow in this. I believe lion's mane and comb's tooth are the ones that do really well in this. Now, why do I want to get rid of this one, guys? What do you think? Well, it's right next to this other tree. This is an oak tree, and it's doing really well, guys. See, look at the canopy, so it's pretty straight. The scaffolding of the tree looks healthy. I don't see dead branches up there. I don't see a hole in the trunk or any other sort of disease issue. So this tree I expect to go well into the future and be fine. This is just taking up sunlight, taking away nutrients from this other tree. Um, this isn't a good understory tree. So I do want to leave some more understory type trees. And what would that be in my woods? Well, I have this, which I believe is sourwood and that never becomes a very tall tree. And what I like about the sourwood, you can actually see some of the remaining pollen clusters. And sourwood, I found out, is actually a pretty popular bee's honey. Um, so that is, this is my one understory that I am kind of leaving uh, many places throughout here, unless it just doesn't make sense. Okay, as we come up to this tree here, what are we looking at? Look how this thing grew. And you know, looking at these trees on the later stage, can help you try to figure out what to do if you have a really young tree and maybe what happened here at some point this tree did a little Y split and just continued to grow like that and what's going to happen someday and i can already see it happening because this this is an oak and a lot of the oak trees are pretty weak and as we saw earlier the inside of the log gets eaten out. You can see like there's some beetle damage or something there. This is not an ideal tree long term. This is not a tree that's good for milling. Imagine trying to mill a tree that's super bent like that. So this is an example of a tree that I should cut down ultimately. It's kind of tricky to cut it though. You know, maybe if I look at this angle better, maybe if I put the right notch in it, I can send it down in this direction and it really wouldn't risk hitting my fence. Now let's look around this tree. Um, do we have any like good trees around it? This one's excellent. This canopy it will completely dominate. You can also see that this bent crazy tree, it's also interacting with that. That's another excellent oak. What you can do is really pick out what are my best trees in this wooded area and how can I change the canopy so that those trees will get the best light so that it'll grow a healthy tree long term. So what I'll do is go through the entire woods, all the things I pre-selected so that I'm not having to think too much with my chainsaw. I have made those decisions ahead of time. I'll cut everything down, I'll come back and I'll walk through again without the chainsaw 
and select some more trees again to let in even more light. It's just gonna allow you to make better decisions by doing it in layers, I think. When I'm pruning a fruit tree, a lot of times, you'll take off main things that you know need to go, and then you step back to look at the structure of the tree, reassess, come back in, thin it more, come back, look at it again, thin it again, and you're going through that process of going to a zoomed out perspective to see what needs to happen next. So as we walk through here, here's that beautiful oak again. And what's next to it? A bent, jacked up tree that will die someday. On this first layer, we're gonna clear out these smaller ones to give me some more perspective to really make the final decision. Yeah, I, I do wanna get rid of this one or whichever it is. Okay, so we've got a small little spindly oak is that ever gonna become a tree underneath this thing? No, it is just screwing around, time to go. This is a hickory right in front here. Hickory is a great tree for me. Uh, they, they drop nuts. You can make a hickory syrup from the bark I learned uh, from a friend recently. So this definitely has agricultural uses for my pigs and maybe another product. Um, it's also a great wood for smoking meat. So, um, but this is uh, never gonna become a good Hickory, is it, underneath that huge canopy? So it's gotta go. Okay, next up we got another sourwood here. That's an understory I'll be keeping. Here's a good area to talk about making decisions and trying to figure out which tree do I wanna select and save? Which one do I not want? Obviously we wanna get rid of these smaller little trees here. We got this little beech, we got an elk here an oak here, and what I'm ultimately gonna be left with once I get rid of these smaller guys is I have this beech and this oak tree here. This is where our decision point comes. This is a great tree. I would like to have a nice uh, beech tree in here, and if I eliminate these, it is gonna be a dominant tree in here. But it would require me to drop this one to give that one enough light. So now what I wanna do is think about is this tree worth taking out? Let's look all around the tree here. And if I look up, the tree is in, is in decent shape. It's definitely way more bent than I want. It's also competing a couple other oak trees in this area as well. And if I look at some of these other trees that I will possibly take out, like this huge leaning one, it's gonna open up a ton of canopy and we can select better oak trees that are straighter and nicer and have a way better chance to live. So we would take out this one, this one, this one, this one. You just leave this one and maybe one way over there so that we can get a lot of light into here. So there's other options too, guys. We can thin all these oak out and I could say, no, I want this maple right here and we're gonna keep that and we're gonna let that be the dominant tree. Or we could say, no, we're gonna let the beech be the dominant tree. And that's just gonna depend on what you want for your farm or what you're trying to accomplish by the trees that you have on your property. I'm taking you through that thought process, not to give you an answer of which trees that I'm going to cut ultimately, but to walk you through so that you can see some of the variables that are good to consider. So how am I gonna establish grass in my silvopasture? Well, normally I would use my pigs and I did run pigs through the woods here through summer and I did drop down barley and stuff, but there just wasn't good enough light for it to grow enough to then drop seed. So what I've done is I brought the sheep in here and the sheep are actually planting the seed for me and I'm taking the hay that I was able to get from my own land this year. I, know, I think I had like 180 to 200 bales of hay, something like that, that we got this last year. So feeding some winter forage for them and spreading the seed. The chickens also are coming through and spreading that out, eating what they can. Um, and then whatever remaining seed just will get worked into the ground. And then in the spring, hopefully sprout some grass. So now I got the sheep back out on the field, but um, in February, I'll probably have them back in here and I'll feed them a ton of the rest of the hay basically um, in here while the winter grass switches to spring and starts to grow again and then we'll get them back out there. But that's how I am spreading my seed. But using animals is an incredibly effective strategy because they're gonna fertilize um, and plant that cover crop in there. And you can see in my pig videos um, how I've done that in the past. So we're looking for trees that are dead or dying. 
We're looking for trees that are bent or do not have long-term growth potential. We're getting rid of those. We're eliminating trees strictly based upon allowing more light into certain areas. Uh, we're also selecting trees that we just don't even need or want. For me, that would be pine trees. It offers me really not much benefit for the land, for animals, for anything. There's, of course, things you can do with pine trees. And the thing that I think that I'm gonna use mine for that I cut this year is they're giant beams, basically. And I read in uh, one of Joel Salatin's book that they used pine to build structures that'll last, you know, around 10 years as long, how long the, these uh, untreated poles will last. But I can make myself a little soil barn or compost barn or a tool shed or whatever. I can just put a few of these poles up um, and then just do a, like a lean-to roof and have a really simple structure that I could use for making a chicken coop or anything like that. So that's what I plan on using my um, pine for. Now there are some big beautiful pines on my property that I will never touch um, but all of this little stuff in here uh, it's shading out my hardwoods it doesn't offer me much benefit so let's just get it out. What I do like is having those pine needles too it's another type of carbon because I do want as much diversity as I can um, but within limits because this is an ag this is agricultural we are focusing on uh, growing food. So here's a, a little example of more early stage when a tree has split its trunk apart and long term that's not good for a tree. So um, if you're in a situation where you're able to change that earlier on and prevent that, that's always nice. So just like on a fruit tree, we're looking for straight, thick caliber, uh, nice whips on our one to two year old trees. Here's another situation to deal with is that this is a hickory. If I would have been here two or three years ago, I could have thinned all this out. This would have been a one-year-old whip and then I could have had this grow straight and I would have had an amazing hickory tree right here is what I would have preferred to have here. We weren't here earlier enough to do that. So as much as I want a hickory here, this is so jacked up. It's never gonna become a good tree. So I'm better off just removing it.